we're here. Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Joshua Del Rio, and I'm going to be presenting an introduction to rhizosphere communities and soil biodiversity and um, what that all means and, and why we should care about it and try to conserve it. So just a bit about myself. Um, I am a master naturalist level one. I, I got that uh, title earlier this year, but um, I joined the um, master naturalist on, in uh, 2020. Um, and some projects I've done so far have been uh, the Hemlock Willia Delgid uh, Phenology Project, as well as some uh, invasive species monitoring and some amphibian migration. Uh, I've worked in outdoor recreation, uh, mostly with some conservation corps, but also for the state of New York. Um, and I've also worked as a land steward in um, a New Jersey nature preserve. And I'm currently a, a full-time student at uh, SUNY ESF, and I'm studying forest health, um, particularly interested in uh, mycology, plant pathology, and my microbial ecology. Um, and my goal is to earn a PhD one day <laughs> and uh, contribute to uh, like forest ecology and maybe hopefully eventually teach at a college level. So um, starting with the basics, um, what is soil? So soil is pretty much just a mixture of minerals, gases, liquids, and uh, organic material. That might be the most important part of, of that whole mixture, really. Um, soil is the foundation of terrestrial life. And uh, conversely, it uh, requires biological processes in order to exist. Um, so we'll get into that a little further in detail a little bit later. Uh, and humus, which some of our gardeners might know, or anybody really might know humus, um, it's uh, decomposed organic matter that can't really be broken down any further. Um, so that makes up about less than 5% of the soil. And we can usually find that on like the top uh, layer here. That's usually like that dark, dark brown kind of black uh, colored material up on the top of the earth there. Um, and soil is a very uh, important carbon sink. So it's pretty much just, um, uh, it's kind of like where carbon goes to, is, is stored essentially. Um, and you can find about more than half of the carbon uh, in soils under the first foot. So pretty much like around here, that's when you really start to get like most of the uh, heavy carbon mineralized materials. Cause once it gets down here, it tends to uh, like chemical processes bind the carbon to other minerals in the soil. So how is it formed? Um, and this might be elementary, but uh, we'll just go through it. So we have uh, the weathering of bedrock by uh, abiotic factors. So like wind, rain, um, out of the, uh, like heavy chemicals, carbon dioxide or whatever, starts to fragment the rock here. Um, and then life happens and then, uh, you know, it gets colonized by uh, like smaller things like mycorrhizae, which are fungus, um, algae and lichen. So those tend to uh, further do like physical breaking down as well as chemical breaking down of the rocks. Uh, and then later on, you get to see um, more life, uh, kind of like grasses, small shrubs, um, so plants and animals, and, and subsequently you get even more breaking down. So these are the biological processes, um, you know, like the death and decomposition of all these living materials adds to the, uh, like the carbon uh, content, but also just like the mineralization, like this, yeah, like breaking down of the minerals of the, um, of the soils. So <clears throat> the entirety of the, all the soils on, on earth are, is known as the pedosphere. Uh, and that interfaces with uh, the biosphere, which is all like the living materials, um, hydrosphere, all the water on earth, uh, the lithosphere, which is essentially just the tectonic plates, um, as well as the atmosphere. So it's just like this intermediate, it's just in the middle being uh, like influenced by all of these, all these factors. And uh, interestingly, most of the soil on Earth at this point is no older than uh, 2.5 million years old. And that was pretty much due to the um, coming of the Pleistocene, which is just the, all the ice ages that happened for 2.5 to like pretty much almost like 11,000 years ago for the last ice age. Um, so what had happened was like uh, huge glaciers would 
at mass and they'll like cover everything and uh, they recede and then new soils were formed and so on and so forth. There was like a whole process for that. So what is soil biodiversity and what does it look like? Uh, biodiversity, which, you know, many of you know already is the variety of life. Um, every kingdom of organism is represented in the soil. So what we have here, we have millipedes, we have fungi, like insects, um, invertebrates, we have uh, like diatoms and algae, uh, ma like micro invertebrates, animals, um, e like every single kingdom or organism is represented. Um, and that's all those organisms essentially require soil um, for habitat and food. Um, and the soil biomass or pretty much all of the living material, like how much it weighs, 70% uh, of it is usually microorganisms. 22% um, are macrofauna, so like your, your invertebrates, your bugs, your, um, your animals. Um, and also 8% uh, of that are the actual plant roots in the soil. And it's estimated that about a quarter of Earth's entire, entire biodiversity is found in soil. So that's a significant uh, number of creatures <laughs> living in, in soils. So the rhizosphere, what is it? Um, rhizo is, uh, is the Greek word for root or root-like. Um, so it's essentially just the, the root microbiome. Um, and it really only contains the plant roots and the microorganisms. That's all that's really technically is a, is a rhizosphere. Uh, macroorganisms, so like uh, invertebrates, whether really small or large, aren't really considered. Um, and that's due to the fact that um, like the microorganisms and the roots, the plant roots themselves have a like a complex chemical interactions um, that make up a lot of the rhizosphere and, and what happens. And we're going to cover that in detail. Um, so as I said before, uh, it's a chemically complex system um, and chemicals tend to be the common language uh, per se. Uh, so the the ability for the organisms to either perceive or or exude or make um, chemicals is is necessary for survival in in this ecosystem. And the rhizoplane uh, is different from the rhizosphere. It's part of the rhizosphere. It's it essentially just the area directly on or around the root structure. So that's this area here. It's just anything that's on the actual root is is considered the rhizoplane. So just a brief review what we covered so far. Soil is the foundation of terrestrial life. And uh, conversely, soil needs the biological processes to exist, that breaking down by the um, by all the all the biology it, it um, is a foundation for. Uh, and soil biodiversity is the variety of all life in soil. Uh, about a quarter of that biodiversity um, is or about a, a quarter of the Earth's biodiversity is contained within the soil. And uh, rhizospheres are chemically complex root microbiomes, um, and they're technically composed of just plant roots and all the microorganisms. And chemicals are the common language in that, uh, in that ecosystem. So what are the key players in the rhizosphere? And we'll get into detail there. Plants, they are foundational. Um, terrestrial plants, uh, fossil evidence kind of has them at about 450 million years old. So that's a lot of time for the creation of rhizospheres. Uh, they're like, the rhizosphere obviously couldn't uh, exist without plant roots. So they're extremely important in the uh, like structural component to this. Um, they facilitate the, any community interactions being the architectural component. Um, they're also the primary producers of energy for others, being photosynthetic. Um, they create all of the carbon, uh, like carbohydrates or acids, like whatever else um, all these other uh, organisms might need to build their bodies. Uh, that's carbon-based, at least. The plants provide that. Um, so about 20 to 40 percent of the photosynthesized carbon that the that the plants make is released into the soil as what is known as root exudates. Also, they're um, 
their litter. So any fruit that might fall, leaves or body parts, you know, eventually when they die, um, will go onto the go onto the soil and uh, you know get get broken down. Get uh, it's just a, another food source essentially for these microorganisms. Um, they're also responsible for soil retention and porosity. Porosity is essentially just uh, the creation of, of uh, space in the soil. So they're for gases or, or microorganisms to live in or other organisms. Um, they're also responsible for uh, carbon fixation. So taking carbon dioxide uh, out of the air and, uh, make, and making it like a, an actual usable form of carbon. Um, so an example of this is a mature tree on average, uh, you know, whatever tree can uh, fix about 48 carbons, uh, 48 pounds of carbon dioxide per year. Um, so it might not seem significant in one year, but over the lifespan of say like a 200 year old tree, that's about 10,000 pounds of carbon uh, fixed into the soil. That's, and if you, you know, multiply that by entire forest, <laughs> significant. Um, so what's interesting this, uh, about this as well is uh, the roots themselves make up, uh, you know, about 8% of the entire soil biomass. So even though they're like, like integral for the structural components, um, they're really not, they don't make up that much of uh, the soil uh, living, any, of any living thing in the soil. So now onto the microorganisms that are uh, the other part of the rhizosphere. Um, so microflora and microfauna organisms. The microflora essentially photosynthetic uh, microfauna are you know heterotrophic, so they uh, they can they need to eat other things. Um, so these include bacteria, archaea, uh, fungi, protozoa, and algae, uh, and these make up a large majority of the soil biomass, um, about seventy percent. Um, and another example of this: in one gram of soil. Uh, you could find, these are high estimates, but, um, you know, 10 billion bacteria, 10 million actinomycetes, which we'll get into further. They're really cool. Um, 10 million fungal cells, 1 million algae, 100,000 protozoa. I mean, these are microscopic organisms, but these numbers are enormous, you know. Um, so no wonder they make up such a large portion. Uh, they support higher trophic levels or other uh, larger organisms on the food web. Um, they make, you know, nematodes eat bacteria and uh, insects eat the nematodes and birds eat the insects, so, so on and so forth. They, they pretty much support the entire system. Uh, they are responsible for the creation of humus, as we mentioned er earlier. Um, they break down the organic matter. Uh, they're also responsible for nutrient extraction, either from the soil itself, from minerals or from atmosphere. And they're responsible for nutrient cycling. So again, like breaking down uh, the carbon uh, into the humus and everything. So we're going to go into just a few of these uh, important uh, microorganisms. Uh, some that do nitrogen fixation. So nitrogen, it's it's a it's a kind of a paradox, right? Because there's like seventy eight percent of the atmosphere is is nitrogen but atmospheric nitrogen is essentially unusable by most organisms on earth. Um, it, we, like our, ourselves, humans can only really use like nitrates, ammonium, other, it, it, there's only has to be like one, it can only be like one nitrogen in, uh, in a chemical compound. It can't be like the N2 that you see here, which is atmospheric nitrogen. Um, and nitrogen, you need nitrogen for proteins, for your nucleic acids, your DNA and RNAs. Um, so these bacteria or, and or cyanobacteria, they're called diazotrophs, um, are extremely important in soils because they, they provide the, um, the ability for other organisms to, to get usable nitrogen. Um, and here I put down like a formula, like they might convert the atmospheric nitrogen into the ammonium or nitrates. So that's either, that's like really common, but there are other bacteria that can uh, break it down even further into nitrites and even back into atmospheric nitrogen. Um, so it's a whole crazy cycle. Uh, they can be, these organisms can be free living. So just, you know, floating around doing your thing, or they can be symbiotic. And, uh, you know, I think most of you might know legumes uh, like peanuts, beans, alfalfa, 
Um, legumes are, you know, I think there's about, they make up a third of the, um, of the flowering species of plants, angiosperms. Um, so they're kind of all over the place, especially in the tropics. Um, so they're pretty important and they, they may, you know, evolve to have this relationship with these bacteria. Um, so they kind of have a leg up, like they, they, they're not worried about getting their nitrogen because they can get it from these guys, essentially. Um, rice, alder, and bayberry are also other organisms that are known to have um, not quite the same type of symbiotic relationship, but uh, a relationship nonetheless. Um, and, and there's many others as well that have this relationship. And uh, just <clears throat> estimated fixation uh, is about for any, for any kind of plot of land for a hectare uh, is about 130 pounds. So that's about one, one cheetah sized, uh, you know, parcel of nitrogen for two and a half acres. Um, it might not seem like a lot, but uh, since, uh, you know, the nutrient cycling is happening, um, the more you put in, the more fertile it's, it, uh, it might be in the long run. Now, actinomycetes, these things are really cool. They're bacteria, um, but they're very similar to fungi. And through convergent evolution, which is uh, like two organisms that, sh that behave or have similar traits just due to common like habitat or lifestyles. Um, so they, uh, they act a lot like fungi. So they form spores and mycelium which are just like these thread light -like networks uh, in the ground or in wood. Um, and they can, uh, they can also decompose complex organic molecules. So they're like primary decomposers. Uh, they're very important in carbon cycling as such as being decomposers um, and the creation of humus. Actually, the, they are responsible for that earthy odor of soil. So anytime you like get a, pick up a, a clump of fresh dirt, and you smell that like earth, you're smelling the actinomycetes in action. Um, that's just, they're responsible for that smell. And uh, that, that chemical is actually called geosmin. Uh, they are producers of powerful antibiotics uh, naturally. They do this to kind of, uh, you know, like claim their turf or whatever, or just, uh, you know, so it's the, it, competition type of a thing. Um, and so we've found that since they do that, we can harness it almost like penicillin, right? And uh, some new uh, drugs have been made from these actinomycetes. So streptomycin for one, actinomycin, I and mean, the list can the list does go on, and it can go on even further. I mean, we've only we only know like a portion of what could be millions of species of this of this organism. So. Um, time will tell what, what else they can do. So they make up about 10 to 30% of all bacteria present in the soil. That's a pretty significant figure considering like how diverse bacteria is. So now onto our book, our Busculum mycorrhizae. We're going to get into the fungus now. Uh, so our Busculum mycorrhizae is about a little older than 450 million years, um, at least the, uh, the family Glomera mycota. Um, so as if you remember in a few previous slides for the plants, um, they are about 450 million years old. So, um, they, these two species plants and this mycorrhizae in, in general may have, uh, co-evolved, uh, like to, to colonize the, the earth, the actual earth. Um, so that's pretty cool that they kind of have fossil evidence for both of those things at the same time. Um, and, you know, I guess like proof is in the pudding, right? Because they're the most common plant symbiont. About 85 to 90% of plants on earth have a relationship with either one or multiple species of this uh, family. They're heterotrophic. So again, they need to like absorb their food. They need to eat stuff um, and they're obligate symbiont. So they can't live without plants. And uh, they're hyphae, which are these like thread-like filaments. Um, they colonize inside of the root uh, as opposed to other, other fungus that colonizes around it. Um, and these don't actually form mushrooms. They still form spores, but they don't form mushrooms. Uh, they do form mycelium, however, uh, those thread-like um, networks. 
and they're important for because they're an important ecosystem engineer. Um, they can be a means for transportation for microorganisms, and we're going to get into this in just a little bit. This is really cool. Uh, they also facilitate information and nutrient exchange between organisms, um, and we'll also get into this. Uh, so as part of their important ecosystem engineering, they produce this one um, compound called glomalin, uh, and they're still like very, there's there's research done on it, but it still needs to be, uh, you know, a little bit more intensive. But so far, uh, what we know is that glomalin may, um, it acts like kind of a coagulant, so it can like hold soils together. Um, it also like helps in water retention, um, nutrient retentions, and it's very abundant in the soil apparently. Um, so I can't wait to see what else we end up finding out about this. It might be extremely important um, for retaining soils in the future. So now ericoid and ectomycorrhizae. Um, ericoid mycorrhizae and, and ectomycorrhizae are essentially a lot younger than our buscular. They're about 100 to 150 million years old. Um, so ericoid is uh, symbiotic to the heather family mostly. Those are like evergreen, a lot of other evergreens are in this family. Um, so these grow uh, within as well as around the root structure. So they're kind of all over the roots here. The ectomycorrhizae, um, I think a lot of us might be a little bit more familiar with these. Um, they grow only more around the, sh as a sheath around the root themselves, um, but they are mushroom forming. So all of the mushrooms that we know and love are essentially, uh, for, for the most part, ectomycorrhizae. Um, they misform myceliums and they are also uh, an ecosystem engineer. And just as arbusculum mycorrhizae, they're heterotrophic, um, they are microscopic as well as macroscopic. I mean, we can literally see this right now. Um, these are the fungus, the, the ectomycorrhizae. Um, and they're also an obligate symbiont, so they also require um, plants in order to, to survive. So these aren't, we're going to go into a few uh, other families or groups that aren't necessarily part of the rhizosphere, but I wanted to touch on them because they're, they're important for soils. So mesofauna, <laughs> uh, they're invertebrates that are less than two millimeters uh, in size. So these are anything from like nematodes, tardigrades, springtails, mites. I mean, the list goes on and on, and they're very, very diverse. I think I was reading one uh, one article that was saying that springtails themselves, there's about 6,500 species of springtails alone. Um, and that was that's data. That was like an article from 1996. Um, so they're, they're, they're abundant for sure. Uh, they're important in the food web. Um, they, you know, they help with the creation of humus. They break down dead and living material. Um, and so this is important. They can't really reshape soil. So they, they, because they're so small, they can't really like create tunnels or anything like that. Um, but they just use the existing pore spaces. And this is why some pore spaces are uh, like necessary for, for uh, healthy soils. But what they can do in those pore spaces is increase the habitability by, uh, you know, breaking down certain materials, excrements, um, their carry-on, their dead bodies, uh, add nutrients to the soils. So macrofauna, these are all of the invertebrates that we know um, and see and can see with our eyes, greater than two millimeters in size. I mean, we have everything from termites, ants, fly larvae, all of it. Um, they are important because uh, they move throughout the soil. So what they do with that, you know, like worms and ants, all of these, they move throughout the soil. So they, they facilitate nutrient dispersal. So they can like take breaking, like nutrients breaking down from the top layer farther into the soils underground and vice versa. Um, and they're also facilitators of soil interaction. So any, micro, any microorganisms that were up top or on the bottom, uh, you know, in that sphere, uh, we can, you know, we can see those nutrients or those microorganisms kind of changing places and they just kind of like mix it up a lot, <laughs> literally what they do. Um, so they're an important forward source for many animals. I mean, you know, birds, 
and it, you know, it just, just keeps going. Uh, and they are important bioindicators of soil health. You know, the fact that we can see them and we know a lot about um, some of the species uh, kind of like lifestyles and behaviors and um, life histories. Uh, we can use that as like, as a way to understand the soil health, you know, so for instance, if one day we see uh, not as many ants in our flower bed or, uh, or we don't hear like nearly as many crickets, um, then we know something might be wrong. Now megafauna. Uh, this guy's enormous. <laughs> they aren't like as big as our elephants or anything like that, um, but they are comparatively gargantuan um, to their uh, to any all the other smaller stuff living in the soil. Um, the large animals living in the soil, but they rarely weigh any any more than two point two pounds. Um, although this mole looks a little a little hefty. Um, so this these compose of reptiles. Uh, you know, such as snakes, amphibians, salamanders, um, and mammals, obviously the small. Um, but so an important distinction of, of megafauna in a soil megafauna is that they rely on soil for habitat and feeding. Um, we know that like rabbits and foxes might make dens in the soil, but they're not necessarily considered megafauna of the soil because they don't eat soil, you know, organisms essentially. Uh, they are important modifiers of soil structure. Um, for an example, a uh, naked mole rat can tunnel um, between one and a half and three miles. Uh, I mean, I, I don't even think I walk three miles in a day. Like that's, that's intense, um, especially for like waters moving through for pr the porosity for other like smaller organisms. Uh, they're, they're very, they make a large habitat for, for these things. Um, and they also facilitate nutrient dispersal with, with all that movement. Um, they're the apex predators because they're the largest. <laughs> and um, along with all the other uh, faunas, uh, they make they all make up about 22% of the soil biomass. So another quick review. Soil biomass, um, which 70% are microorganisms, 22 the, the faunas, and 8% uh, is just plant roots. Uh, the plants make up the rhizosphere and they're the primary producers. And that microorganisms are important for soil formation and that nutrient extraction and cycling as well. Uh, mesofauna increase the habitability of the pore spaces found in the rhizosphere. And macrofauna and megafauna actually create those spaces and are also important for nutrient dispersal. So now we're gonna look into uh, what these rhizosphere community interactions look like and why they're important and why we're talking mm -hmm. about them. So the plant soil feedback loop, it's really all about chem chemical interactions. Plant roots secrete um, their photosynthesized carbon as carbohydrates or hormones or uh, organic acids. And these uh, impact the community structure because they essentially either attract or repel certain microorganisms. Um, carbohydrates are like sugars. So, you know, a, uh, an example of this would be that I did some work with some alfalfa recently that uh, I found that insect herbivory above ground. So, in a, like a plant that was getting eaten by an, an insect would, uh, would show a more recruitment or like attract more of one organism than another organism. Um, in a similar uh, controlled environment. Um, so this just says that there's, there's a lot going on um, and it's just all the nuances are, 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 are specific. Um, so microbial community may also influence uh, the plant fitness. So the, the microbes themselves can, um, can like increase growth stimulation or uh, you know, it like help with stress tolerance or immunity. Um, they can be a form of biocontrol as like helping immunity. So if there's a like covering of, of certain microorganisms on a plant root, um, other pathogens might not be able to penetrate. Um, the rhizosphere ecology includes competitions, mutualisms, predations, everything that we see above ground here, everything that we live with, um, we see the same thing in the soil essentially. 
Um, and another important part of this uh, chemical interactions are these communications, either interkingdom, meaning uh, like a plant with a fungus or interkingdom with a plant with a plant. So these communications are all done through chemical signalings and they're a common language. So crosstalking is just a term about, um, it's with two or more organisms using a similar communication pathway. So these are just like receptors on their cells that can like uh, pretty much interpret the same, uh, in, well, yeah, use the same uh, compound or hormone or whatever um, and interpret it uh, similarly. And uh, some work has been done on this. Um, some of you might know like all these terms here, uh, but the work of Susan Samard and others, uh, forest ecologists, um, the Wood Wide Web and the Mother Tree and the Fungal Highway. Um, we're gonna go into these and I'll, I'll explain all this in just a bit. So here I have a, uh, this is just a figure. It's a, I thought it was like one of the best figures uh, that I found in some literature I was reading. Um, but so there's a lot going on and I'm, I'm gonna just get your attention over here. Um, what I wanna show you here first is just uh, that the, the gradients, either moisture gradients, light gradients, pH gradients um, are all kind of like influential to what kinds of organisms you might find. So one bacteria might like it up here, whereas another one might like it down here. Um, so these are all kind of niche spaces, which increases the amount of species possible um, that you might find in a rhizosphere. Um, so essentially what's happening here though, is that uh, these plants are constantly exuding um, these, these chemicals, right? And they might be like sugars or hormones, as we said before, um, and they're attracting or uh, like, you know, they want to attract uh, beneficial bacteria or fungus or what have you. Um, and other like because of the complexity of this uh, ecosystem, there are a lot of influences here. So an insect that might be, uh, you know, eating the leaves on top could influence what types of chemicals are being sent out, put out by the plant. Um, and as well as any, uh, any influences from, from below, from below grounds. So insects like beetle larvae that might be eating the plant roots or nematodes that might be eating the bacteria that, that are on the root could also influence this. Um, so these kind of either attract or repel, uh, either these bacteria or the fungi. Um, it's, it's extremely complex, uh, but it's super cool. I thought this is like a really good simplified version of, of what's kind of like happening underground. So this is uh, an image of a, what I mentioned before, a rhizoplane. So this is just a root. This is just a one plant root right here. Here's a little fungal hyphae. Um, and we have bacteria and an amoeba and some nematodes. So these, um, so these, this plant root are, is secreting some, you know, some like sugars or whatever, and that might either be attracting or repelling certain organisms, um, depending on what compound it is and what these organisms like. Uh, but here, what I wanted to show you, I thought this was a good image of um, kind of like biocontrol. So for instance, let's just say that these are like good bacteria that, um, that the plant like would love to have on them. But first, this amoeba is eating them, and then there's like less. There's less of them to be to 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 have to like take up the space. So now these like pathogenics uh, are kind of like going to attack the uh, the roots and might cause harm. Um, so this is just a good like image of of what biocontrol might look like on uh, in the rhizosphere. All right, all right, now is the really cool stuff. At least the stuff I like to geek out about. Um, so this is uh, kind of the work of, of Susan Samard. Um, so this is what we call the, uh, the wood wide web. Um, so here we have a deciduous tree and a coniferous tree. And uh, both are producing carbons or fix, fixing carbons and, and secreting them. Um, but they're connected with a ectomycorrhizal fungi. And what this fungus is doing, it's pretty much the mediator of, uh, of like the, 
the sugars, the chemicals that these guys are putting out. Um, let's say it's let's say it's winter time. This this tree no longer has leaves on it, so it's not photosynthesizing actively. If it needs some sugars to survive the winter, this fungus could tap into the sugars that this tree is still producing. It's a coniferous, so it's evergreens. It's green all year. Um, take these carbon, give it to this one. Sur this one survives the winter. Um, so on and so forth. I mean, it's it's just fantastic work. Uh, so also the, to mention the mother tree, let's just pretend that this is like a um, a decid like a the offspring of this tree here. Um, we like this mother, the little seedling. Well, it'll it'll recognize its its kin and uh, essentially just give it carbon to kind of survive. Uh, like it's it's youth until like the canopy opens up and it can grow into its own tree um so this is just really fantastic works and this is kind of like what's happening in our forests really now this is just another image of, of of the same project like the mother tree project and this is just showing you here is like all these circles are trees and all the black lines are um fungal associations between the trees so we can see that it, it's it's just a network. They're all linked up together. It's like a neural network. It's like the internet. I don't know. I mean, it's crazy. Um, so this this is pointing to the tree with the most associations. And why this tree is important is because it acts as a hub. It's like it's like the Grand Central Station. It's like a reservoir for all like nutrients, but all also uh, microorganisms, uh, genetic material. Uh, it's it's like extremely important like these old trees have all like it's connected to every single tree here um it's fantastic work and why this is important we're going to get into that <laughs> right now so this stuff is super cool i'm just going to show you here this is the fungal highway um i thought this video was like really neat i really wanted to share it with you uh, i i i can't get enough of this so what pretty much what these scientists have done they grew some fungus in a petri dish as, and introduced uh, a certain bacteria. And now we're gonna see them like move together essentially. So what we have here, we have this, um, this is a fungal hyphae, all of this. And around it is like this mucosal aqueous layer. And you see like the nutrients or whatever might be like flowing inside of the fungus, but around it, these are all bacteria just moving, doing their thing. and it's all in real time like this is happening if you can just imagine this is like this is happening right now outside of your house uh or wherever you are in your forest wherever like this is happening all over the earth it's it's so cool um so what this means is just like this is <laughs> i just can't get over it. it's so cool uh so, but we, if we put that, if we put that like there, right, it, we, all these microorganisms are just moving all over this thing at any given time. That's just fantastic. So there's a lot. The soil is really cool. Okay, so just a, another review here. So the plant soil feedback, um, complex ke chemical interactions uh, in, in the rhizosphere. Uh, you know, the plants create the rhizosphere and they influence what types of communities are, are there. Um, and also those, those organisms that are part of the community could influence the plants themselves. Um, again, we see this like reciprocity here. Uh, and also chemicals tend to be, to, are the common language within the soil. Um, and as we saw in the mother tree um, example, large established micro, microorganism communities can benefit the, the rhizosphere fitness or just like the entirety of of the ecosystem essentially by harboring by being a, by being a reservoir for those um, also communication and nutrient transfers between organisms are mediated by the mycorrhizae um, i mean they take a tax for for their services but they play an important role um, and also plants can recognize kin through the mycorrhizae um, they can recognize pathogens and symbionts uh, and microorganisms can uh, use the mycorrhizae for transport, as we saw in that video. So why are these community interactions important? And what threatens the soil biodiversity? 
also what can we do to uh to preserve the soil biodiversity and encourage soil health so the importance of a healthy rhizosphere are many we didn't talk too much about ph balance or ph in general but um a healthy rhizosphere you'll see you will see more um kind of like less less fluctuation in in ph balance uh or in ph in general um you also see like more soil porosity so this was a good image of soil porosity here are, are all these like little cavities um you know these can harbor like those mesofauna uh, that can be good for gas retention and water retention um also uh healthy Rhizosphere is good for nutrient retention, you know, just like the cycling of the carbon and the nitrogen and the phosphorus, all that. Um, it's also good for erosion control. You know, the more roots you have, <laughs> like the less it's going to go anywhere. Uh, it's uh, it's good for carbon sequestration because all this all this organic material will eventually make its way all the way down here and then just be stuck there, hopefully. Uh, and then it's good for community immunity and for community fitness. Um, so like, you know, the healthier rhizosphere you have means there's probably a very diverse group of organisms there, which like in turn, um, like there's a, there's a correlation between uh, like health and, and biodiversity. It's also good for uh, bioremediation. So any kind of like, mm, I guess like toxic, uh, toxic, yeah, like, it, pollutions, pollutants are if they're abundant, they could a uh, healthy rhizosphere could really help improve that soil. Um, so now, what the th what are the threats? Uh, I mean, number one is probably industrial agriculture. I mean, it's great; it feeds like very many people, and it's it's efficient. But it's uh, you know, in like this metric, for the last forty years, we've lost about a third of the arable lands. So with that loss of land, I mean, we lose soils, but we like, we have to get more, we have to get that land back in order to, to grow more food, right? So like deforestation is also kind of like, goes hand in hand with industrial agriculture really. And with deforestation, we see the loss of, of those, of those like mother, of those mother trees, of those uh, like, those organisms that can like uh, act as reservoirs for, for like micro, microorganisms or, or anything else really. Um, and we tend to see erosion um, and compaction. So this metric is about, we lose about 75 billion tons of soil annually. And two thirds of that uh, is in agriculture. Um, this is globally, of course, but um, that's, that's a lot, <laughs> you know, it's all ending up in the ocean and, you know, we're just gonna have to keep like cutting down forests to, to get it back essentially. Um, so pollution is also a big threat to, to rhizospheres and, and soil in general, uh, the use of fertilizers. Um, I mean, this is like industrial fertilizers, you know, like, uh, synthetic, uh, pesticides as well, like synthetic pesticides and plastics, you know, um, they're, you know, I don't like, how long does it take for a plastic bottle to decompose? I mean, thousands of years. So also acidification is, is, um, is a threat because you know the more acidic this is, goes with the ph balance the more acidic a soil is the less likely you'll see growth in it uh, as the same goes for if it's more alkaline um you'll probably see less growth in it um and this this is kind of directly uh caused by fertilizers really um you see with more nitrogen fertilizers you see more acidification and with that is uh, desertification or, you know, the creation of, of deserts or dust bowls, kind of like what we're seeing here. Um, yeah, like erosion and deforestation really contribute to that. Uh, also, um, maybe not as like dire, but still it should be within our, um, within our radar is like invasive species can, um, can have a, a major effect. Um, I'm, I'm sure some of you may know, but garlic mustard, uh, has this like ability to change soil chemistry. Um, they put out like the root exudates that they put out can actually affect uh, other organisms within their rhizosphere. Um, and what it's been found actually some certain connections between ectomycorrhizae and some trees uh, have been disrupted by garlic mustard. Um, and that in turn can affect the entire like rhizosphere of, of in that area. 
Also, extinction may may be a, a major threat. I mean, with by 2070, this is a high metric, but um, about a third of all species may be extinct by that time. So what that is, like we're losing not just the plants, not just the animals, but all the microorganisms associated with those organisms. And if we lose those, it may be really difficult to reestablish um, uh, like ecosystems to what they once were. And also we just lose a lot of genetic material, like different types of uh, like ways to adapt to, to changing environments or anything like that. Um, and also climate change is a major threat. I mean, droughts, extreme weather events and fires. I mean, you know, like it, when it rains here, it, I'm in central New York. So I like lately it's been raining, not too bad, but I remember some pretty crazy rains. So what can we do to help this? Compost, keep that carbon in the ground. Um, you know, if we like organic, organic materials and landfills uh, contribute to, uh, to greenhouse gases in the air, like methane and carbon dioxide. If we compost those, we can keep that carbon in the ground. Um, and also it, support, it supports soil formation and also like healthy rhizospheres. Uh, we can also, you know, do, do a little more work with like municipal, state or federal policies. Uh, you know, municipal, we can do like more community gardens and thus use our the composts for that we can do more industrial composting um i know like i live in tompkins county and there's a you know a taxpayer uh funded um uh like compost recycling uh thing going on which is awesome um there's also you know ecologically responsible land management which is it's a broad term for a very large amount of things that we could do but for example is like um using like organic fertilizers or organic pesticides um or or even like using like uh we're creating bioswales in like parking lots so just like pretty much like planting a bunch of plants like and just to help like storm drainage and runoff i mean the list goes on and on for that and also just kind of like you know like really acting for to stop deforestation at least of of pre-existing forests um and also support polyculture farms and practices in the gardens so polyculture farms is just like the use of many different uh species in a in a in an agricultural practice so this this goes in hand in hand with kind of deforestation i mean we we need timber for products and stuff but if we do a lot of those a lot of those uh like tree farms those um plantations tend to be like single species only but if we do more polyculture more polycultural species we might see um just more ecologically responsible that way um, also in your garden you can do the same thing also if you're you know in the outdoors stay on trail um but this is especially true in vehicles vehicles tend to chew up like mountain bikes and specifically uh um snowmobiles they just do a uh, so much damage to the soil um so it's important to 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 know to do that uh also we can you know clean off our shoes or vehicles before we travel this is just to reduce the risk of invasive species um you know catalog and remove them also catalog natives and support the natives uh, plant perennials with biennials this is important because the perennials act as like a hub for those microorganisms we we're talking about um, and the annuals and biennials kind of create those those pore spaces and when they die they kind of feed the rat, feed like that community so it's good to plant these together um, you could also mow less or rake less uh, mowing less would uh, kind of help, especially in the summer, kind of um, like the microclimate, like keep water uh, in the ground. Um, also raking would uh, kind of insulate during the um, during winter. And in agricultural practices, plant buffer areas near the streams. So just like a, a bunch of you know, like trees or shrubs by the streams to help retain the soil. Um, ridge planting, which is um, known to help like erosion control and no tilling as well. So you keep like the carbon cycle down in there and, and hopefully uh, like the root systems are still there. So it helps erosion control as well. Uh, now some projects and events and I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll put this in the chat for y'all, um, all this stuff. So there's a, a site, the New York Soil Health, they have like field days. 
um, and they're a really good resource for soil management and agricultural innovations. Um, so is the co-op extension, the Cornell co-op. Um, so they do some really cool stuff. Um, oh, there's this one project that's really awesome. It's the, uh, the soil collection program uh, and it's done by the University of Oklahoma. So what you can do, you can like go out into your backyard, take a little sample of soil, send it to these guys and they'll investigate um, if there's any like new or novel organisms that might make some certain compounds that can be used in medicines as we talked about before the dinomycetes. Um, they make like these uh, antibiotics. So, um, but then there, there can also be organisms that can be used for bleach, like, you know, like organic bleaching or like pulp making for papers or so on and so forth. I mean, there's just like so much we could do with these microorganisms. Um, so this is really cool what they're doing there. Um, you can like catalog and remove invasive species when you can, especially garlic mustard. <laughs> um, and uh you know, you can you can like join the any prism or um, IMAP uh, NY, uh, and also uh, the New York Mycological Society is doing some really cool stuff with um like not soils per se, but these soil organisms. Like they're doing this like gene genetic sequencing of of like mushrooms in in New York State, and uh, you know they're finding some like like new novel stuff there. Um, they also have, like are have really cool events and forays. You can join them. Um, I think they have like a, a walk every like uh, every Saturday or Sunday in New York, like near New York City um, and but they're like kind of found throughout the state so um, they do some really cool stuff and uh, yeah I mean that was these are references for my presentation so that's pretty much that's pretty much it everybody if you have any questions I'll be happy to take them. Excellent. Thank you very much, Josh. That was fascinating. Cool. No problem. So I have a question. I'm going to not see any other questions just yet. So I'll give people a chance to type some in. But I have a question. So if conifers can photosynthesize during the winter and provide food sources for nearby trees, does that mean it's beneficial to include a coniferous component in our forests? Um, so I'm not in like a complete expert, <laughs> but I would say that depending on, I guess, like the type of soils that you have. And I think conifers tend to maybe want to be like north facing on a slope. Like if, you know, like they have like a, if you have like a, I don't know, a hill or mountain or something, um, I would say, I guess it depends um, if they're also like, if they're if they make good companions um, for those for those like species, um, that being said, uh, I don't see what the what any kind of drawback would be unless it would be um, if they're if they yeah if they like introduce like a, a kind of like um, I guess like a a rot or another fungus thing that might be bad like for the other trees. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would. I'll look into that. <laughs> okay. For sure. All right, thanks. Um, well, Steve Kinney asks, if you own a piece of land that has a field that has highly compacted soil, what would be a good strategy for enhancing the soil quality? Right, so yeah, there's there's been like a lot of work done with this. I think to start out with, at least compacted is, is tough because um, water tends to run off um, it doesn't really, uh, like the porosity is kind of gone. So what I would do is kind of like start with planting, uh, I guess either grasses or shrubs that have like deep tap roots to kind of break that up. Um, at least, you know, that was like some, that was like, a from one of the literatures I was reading was, um, that was a suggestion or some work that they were doing was like, the deep rooted stuff. So alfalfa, for instance, like some of their roots can go like up to 15 feet into the ground. But also um, I think they were also doing uh, like sunflowers, but that might also be for bioremediation as well. So if there was like heavy metals, I know like sunflowers are really good for extracting like leads out of the soils. Um, so yeah, if there is if there is a compacted land, I, I think that would be a good place to start. Okay, 
Uh, somebody else asks, can you address the impact of the arrival of European and Asian earthworms on forest health? Oh, so I'm not too familiar on those actual, uh, on, on like what impacts they actually have. Um, I'm more familiar with like the chestnut blights that, you know, wiped out the American chestnuts and um, kind of the more like fungal associated uh, like Dutch elm disease. Um, so I, I think from like, I guess my take on it would be since th th like all the organisms here didn't really uh, evolve with those organisms, those, those um, worms that, I mean, it can't be, it can't be like great. I think they would like disrupt the nutrient cycle. The, um, the porosity would, pr they might have to like adapt to more porous a more porous uh, soils like that these that these worms um, kind of make you know like that's like what they do they just burrow through the through the soils so I can't really they might also like you know bring diseases as well but you know that's that's I I can't speak for that. Okay, uh, there's another question from Marla. Do you have knowledge about the span and feet, for example, of the roadsides? They're affected by winter salt application to clear the roads, and to what extent the soil can recover. Oh, that's a that's a really good question. I mean, I see that all the time, especially in central New York, just driving around the roads. Um, I'm I'm not totally familiar, like how how far they might get affected, but from what I've seen, though, and from like a colleague of mine was doing some work with. Uh, Daphnia, which are like water fleas uh, that were found in those uh, in those areas of the the next to the road, those those areas, the drainage. Um, some of them ended up being kind of malformed, um, but they were still alive. Even this is after a salting event. Um, so, I guess what we can take away from that, and what she was pretty much getting at, was that they're adapting to it. Uh, all, albeit like they're kind of malformed and it might be affecting their genetics like internally and like re I don't know reconfiguring it somehow but they're still alive they're adapting to it and knowing that plants are kind of polyploidy or they have like multiple chromosomes uh, so they can they can take a lot of damage before they actually get damage for example you know um, like we only have two chromosomes uh, plants can be, can have four or six or eight, depending on the plant. So they in turn, they've like, it's a theory that they like evolved that the, the polyploidiness in order to be able to withstand more, um, like stresses of, of that kind. So I can't really speak for, um, like for what that all means. I mean, I guess we'll find out in time <laughs> with more like research and everything, but that's a really good question. Okay, and one last question. How does this information influence the practice of weeding a garden in the disruption to roots and organisms? Yeah, this is, uh, I was like thinking about this earlier too. I was like looking at my garden. It was like, cause I kind of let it just, just do its thing. I planted some arugula and, and some chard and like, I haven't really been weeding that well. And they're, they're noticeably not doing as great as they would be. Uh, but what I have found though, is like, there's an abundant, there's like a lot more life. Like there's a lot more pollinators that I've not seen before. Um, there's beetles, there's a bunch of different flies. There's like, I don't know. And I think all, what all of that is doing, I see like less, uh, less things eating it really. Like last year I was like weeding like crazy and my arugula was just, just gone. Um, so something like aphids or something was really getting at it. Uh, but now it's like, it's getting eaten a little bit, but it's not really as pronounced. So I'm just gonna keep letting it do its thing. Uh, and I guess I'll get back to you on this like weird experiment that I'm doing with it. But I would say, you know, at least from what I'm doing now, I think it's, I think it's going all right, you know? Okay, wonderful. Oh. 
Thank you very much, Josh. That was really uh, very interesting and a kind of a new topic for the group. So I appreciate it. And it was uh, an excellent presentation. Sure. Thank you. Thank you all. And yeah, thanks to everybody who joined tonight. There were 28 people on, and that's pretty good for a beautiful early uh, or late spring evening. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.